section of QI Connect, our last QI Connect of the decade. I'm Ruth Glassborough, Director of Improvement at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and I'm your new chair uh, for QI Connect. QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health and social care and beyond to learn from international leaders in the fields of improvement, innovation and integration. So welcome. I'm now going to pass you over to Jennifer, who will tell you a little bit more about the session and the technology. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Good afternoon, Bruce, and good afternoon to all of our QI connectors joining us on the session today. Um, it's great to see so many of you on the call. Um, so just a couple of quick housekeeping slides to get us started. If you could please use the chat function that you see on the right hand side of your screen to communicate and I'll talk you through this in just a moment. We do design these sessions to be really fun and interactive. Um, so we'll come to just to tell you a little bit more about how to get more involved. Any technical difficulties such as not being able to hear the presenter speak or if you keep losing connection, um, then please message the event manager using the chat function or by pressing star zero on your telephone keypad. So these sessions are designed to be a fun, interactive learning experience. We do encourage you to use the chat function to share any questions, comments or ideas throughout the talk. And there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the session. We will also be sharing hyperlinks within the chat function to any resources mentioned by our speaker today. So we did promise that today's session was going to be interactive and now we're at the interactive point. And we're keen to find out where you're joining us from today. If you could please select the annotation tool that you see on the left hand side of your screen, it's just circled there in red. And then if you could click on the arrow icon, also circled in red there. And then we'll go to the map. So if you could just select the country that you're joining us from using the arrow, we know that there can sometimes be a slight delay from colleagues joining out with the UK. Hello, Valerie. This is where we see the UK start to disappear. So welcome everyone. I'm just actually going to now hand back to Ruth who's just going to take you into the second interactive point, which is our competition. Just give us a moment. So regular QI connectors will know that we run a competition on each session. So in a minute, I'm going to show you a slide with a series of flags and the winner will be the first person to click on the flag for the country that I'm about to call out. So today, we are looking on the flag for Bermuda. Anybody spot the Bermuda flag? Well, everyone's given it a good thought to think about. Oh. Mm. Peter Anderson, well done. Well done, Peter. Excellent. The reason why we have called out Bermuda is it's our new country. We have a registrant joining us today from Bermuda Hospital Board, so welcome to them. We now have 63 countries represented in our QI Connect community. So congratulations uh, to Peter. You've won a QI Connect mug. We will get that over in the post to you uh, shortly. So as of October, we now have 1,226 organizations registered with us to watch QI Connect. We have representatives from every NHS board in Scotland. And we have a range of um, colleges and universities across the world that join us. We now have 89 in total linking in. For those of you who are relatively new, or also for the folk who've been with us for a long time, you can always watch our back catalogue at any time. They're available on our website. Really good value for money there. I also just want to highlight the sponsors for QI Connect. 
So ISCA is the, um, one of our sponsors, and our QI Connect series features an approved resource within their fellowship program. And we also have the Health Foundation who have supported us and uh, helped support us with funding as well, and they are co-funded by NHS Improvement. A call out to the QI Connect team who help and ensure this all runs so smoothly. And then also to mention that today we're joined by Jonathan O'Reilly, who will be our guest questionnaire at the end of the presentation. Please also remember to tweet as you learn. Um, so all of you tweeters out there, please keep tweeting throughout this presentation and share what you're learning. And then on to the main event. So I am absolutely delighted today to welcome Tijal Gandhi, who is our guest speaker. She is the Chief Clinical and Safety Officer for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and she leads the IHI programs focusing on improving patient and workforce safety. She is a prominent advocate for patient safety at the regional, national, and international levels, and so I'm delighted that she has taken the time out of a very busy schedule to share with us today some of her insights and thoughts on patient safety. So with no further ado, I will hand over now to Tijal to share with us. Thank you so much, and it's really my pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, so I am going to talk to you about patient safety and really how we can try to accelerate our progress towards creating a world where patients and those who care for them are free from harm. Um, so uh, I will start. Um, so we all know patient safety is a public health issue. Uh, despite the progress that we've made, and I will say we have made a lot of progress in the last 20 years. Um, in the U.S., we often use uh, 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 the publishing of To Air as Human as kind of the start of when we really started thinking about patient safety, and this is the 20th anniversary of the release of To Air as Human from back in 1999. And so we have made progress in the last 20 years, but despite that, preventable harm remains unacceptably frequent. There's significant mortality, morbidity, quality of life implications, and it really affects patients in every care setting. And we've been talking a lot about broadening our definition of harm. Traditionally, I think when we started in patient safety, we were really focusing on physical harm, particularly in the inpatient setting, uh, central line infections, falls, um, wrong side surgery, those kinds of things. But we're starting to talk much more about broader uh, types of harm or other types of harm, including emotional harm, uh, psychological harm, socio-behavioral harm, harm that is from distrust and reluctance to seek care. Um, disrespect is something that is coming up more and more as well, that patients actually perceive disrespect as a form of harm. Um, so uh, broadening harm to be both physical and psychological. Um, we're also uh, broadening to think about harm to all, meaning that patients are not the only ones being harmed by healthcare. In the United States, at least, um, our statistics in the U.S. say that it is uh, that healthcare is more dangerous than mining, manufacturing, or construction in terms of physical harm. And then there's also huge amounts of psychological harm with bullying, disrespectful behavior, um, et cetera. So uh, we've been saying, uh, particularly through our Lucian Leap Institute, which is our think tank at IHI, um, that uh, the physical and psychological safety of the workforce is really a pre condition to ensuring safety for patients. And so uh, we need to broaden when we think of harm, uh, not just to patients, but also to that workforce or to caregivers when you start thinking about even settings outside of the hospital, which gets me to the other way that we're really broadening how we're thinking about harm in that we're thinking about it across the entire care continuum. Um, the vast majority of care is actually given outside of hospitals. And there's more and more data about the risks and harms that are occurring in um, settings outside of hospitals, including 
uh, primary care specialist um, practices, but also ambulatory surgery, dialysis centers, nursing homes, rehabs, and then care in the home. Uh, and so I think we have much more to really learn and explore on that front, which I'll talk about in uh, a little bit. But uh, I wanted to start us off with really thinking about that broadening of harm over the last 20 years or so. And then um, another thing that we've been thinking about a lot is how do we make safety a core value of an organization um, or of a practice or of our clinicians as opposed to a priority? And the reason I, I use that distinction is because priorities can change, whereas values really um, stay uh, constant. And so um, making safety into not just the priority of the organization or the thing we're doing this year or this month or for this project, um, to really making safety be about uh, the way we do things around here and really tying it into the cultural piece, which we know is critical. So um, I mentioned to Eris Human, and um, I have to update this slide actually uh, uh, because um, it's now 20 years, uh, but we had done some work a few years ago to really think about how do we accelerate our progress um, since to Eris Human. And uh, so about three years ago, we released a report called Free From Harm that was a compilation of uh, convening of experts um, both in the U.S. and uh, internationally around what are ways that we can really accelerate our progress in patient safety, um, building on the progress that we've made thus far. And uh, so we had convened this panel, and the panel did feel that overall healthcare is safer now than it was in 1999, but as I mentioned earlier, there's much more work to be done, and um, it's important to not be discouraged by the more work to be done. This is a really uh, young field that we're still learning quite a bit about what it's going to take to drive safety, and so, uh, and there's been relatively limited investment, so we didn't want to um, be discouraged by that, but just say we have made progress, but let's really think about acceleration and really understanding that this is complicated. It's a very... Um, a complex problem to solve, and it's going to require work by uh, many diverse disciplines to really to really solve patient safety. And when I say solve, um, I also want to mention we know that there's always going to be new harms, new risks, new things. So you know, probably solve is not the best verb, even because we are going to have to have constant attention to safety. But really, again, we're going to need many disciplines to help us think about new approaches as we do that. So a key finding from that group of experts that we pulled together was this idea of really trying to think about a total systems approach and shifting uh, patient safety efforts from being reactive and piecemeal to a total systems approach. And so what I mean by that is often when you talk to people working in patient safety in organizations, um, it often feels like it's project by project. You've got an initiative on uh, falls, and you've got an initiative on medication errors, and you've got an initiative on um, uh, surgical site infection. And it's very one by each. And what we talk about in this report is that we need to really focus on things that are foundational, things that are going to um, get us to a total systems approach, lay the foundations, by which then these specific initiatives can actually um, have the fertile soil in which they can thrive. And so what we talk about in this report is really what are those foundational things that we can do to advance uh, total system safety and then again help uh, accelerate our progress on specific initiatives. And so we came up with eight recommendations for achieving total system safety, and I will walk through um, each of these relatively quickly. And so um, the eight are actually in no particular order, except that number one was pretty unanimously felt to be number one. Uh, so don't pay mind to the other order, but one was number one. And that is ensure that leaders establish and sustain a safety culture, then create centralized and coordinated oversight of patient safety, create a common set of safety metrics that reflect meaningful outcomes, increase funding for research in patient safety and implementation science, address safety across the entire care continuum, support the healthcare workforce, 
themes that I've already mentioned, um, partner with patients and families, and ensure that technology is safe and optimized. And so those are the eight recommendations that I will quickly walk through. So number one, ensure that leaders establish and sustain a safety culture. We've all been working on culture for the last 20 years. Um, we know how critical that culture is um, that is going to enable and prioritize our make safety a core value, I should say. Um, and the way we talk about safety culture, there's lots of definitions, but professionals are accountable for unprofessional conduct but not punished for human mistakes. Errors are identified and mitigated proactively, and there are strong feedback loops, learning systems basically, to enable learning from previous errors to prevent recurrences. Um, so when we, in the United States, when we look at how we're doing on culture, it's it's a bit disheartening um, because we have been thinking about this for 20 years, and I'm guessing in other places around the world uh, you're in a similar situation, though hopefully maybe a little further along than we are in the U.S. But when we look at our national data on, uh, on culture um, from a survey that's a standardized survey instrument that many hospitals in the U.S. use, um, about half of respondents feel that they are still working in a punitive environment. And so, um, you know, the fact that we've been working on this for 20 years and we still have half of people saying that is definitely a bit discouraging. On the other hand, I think that's our opportunity for improvement and acceleration because we've learned a lot in the last 20 years about how to work on culture. And so one of the things that we um, created uh, at the National Patient Safety Foundation, now IHI's Lucian Leap Institute, um, is this uh, document called Leading a Culture of Safety, a Blueprint for Success. And the idea of this document was let's provide really clear, um, a really clear roadmap with strategies and tactics for how to create a culture of safety. Let's not keep it at this very vague, amorphous um, instruction to leaders of organizations um, you know, hey, CEO, go create a culture of safety. We wanted to get really practical strategies and tactics. And so that's what this report is, and it's a compilation of some convenings we did with researchers on culture, with safety experts, with leaders such as CEOs and board of director members, um, et cetera. And, uh, and then we came up with this report. And it's based on six domains that we felt were critical for driving a culture of safety, and those are shown here. Um, setting a clear vision for zero harm, trust, respect, and inclusion, engaging the board, developing leaders, having just culture, and setting clear behavioral expectations. And so in that document, within those six domains, you'll see um, strategies and tactics that really drill down into very specific things that organizations can be doing, and there's also an assessment tool. All right. So number two, create a centralized and coordinated approach to patient safety. And um, back in 1999, uh, again, in the U.S., um, to air as human called for more coordination at the national level. Um, other countries have actually really done this um, quite well, uh, Scotland being a great example, Denmark, other countries as well, where they, there is sort of this national um, coordinating uh, function around patient safety. And um, so I'll go through this pretty quickly because, uh, unfortunately, in the U.S., uh, we have many organizations that are involved in patient safety that haven't been super well coordinated, and uh, we actually have created a national steering committee actually building on work out of Canada, particularly in terms of a way to have everybody um, kind of uh, swimming together uh, to accelerate our progress in patient safety. And so, um, so we're excited about what's happening in the U.S. on that front, excited to also learn from what other countries have been doing to have that coordinated approach at the national level. And then we're, uh, these are the four areas we're focusing on with our um, uh, national committee, culture, leadership, and governance, not surprisingly, learning systems, patient and family engagement, and the workforce. And you've heard those themes already in my talk. Um, and really building on this uh, framework for safe, and safe, reliable, and effective care that really talks about leadership, culture, learning systems, and patient and family engagement. Um, we are also excited to see that we're starting to see even more national, uh, even more coordination globally, and the World Health Organization has obviously played a huge role in that um, uh, with uh, some national work, that, uh, sorry, global work that they've been doing and also with that creation of World 
Patient Safety Day, which was on September 17th, and um, uh, the UN uh, Global Assembly also doing work on patient safety, starting to see patient safety as part of um, the G20 coming up and so forth. So uh, I'm optimistic that, you know, at the national level we're seeing more coordination, but then we'll have this global coordination as well. Number three, uh, create a common set of safety metrics. And um, so, you know, measurement is foundational to learning and improvement. And I think the current set of safety measures that we have have been um, uh, not the best, honestly. Um, most of our safety measures have been inpatient focused, have been really based on what we can measure as opposed to what we should measure. Um, and uh, and so we think there needs to be kind of a, a rebooting of how we think about safety measurement that really thinks about measurement that spans the entire care continuum, measurement that may, moves us to more proactive forms of measurement as opposed to reactive. So instead of measuring or in addition to measuring harm, we're also going upstream and trying to measure risk and hazard so we can intervene before the harm occurs. Um, so the Lucian Leap Institute um, recently convened a Salzburg Global Seminar to try to create global principles for safety measurement, sort of building on some of the, these things that I'm mentioning to say, you know, whether you're a health ministry, whether you're a hospital or a health system, whether you're an ambulatory practice, these are some global principles around safety measurement that you ought to be considering as you develop your measures to understand your um, safety in your context. And so uh, we actually just in December will be releasing that list of um, global principles. So something for all of you to look out for, but we had a great um, convening at the Salzburg Seminar to really with a very global audience to try to think through what some of those principles ought to look like. Number four, uh, increase funding for research. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the start, there hasn't been a huge amount of funding for patient safety, and, and it is a, a young field still. And so there's much more that we need to understand about safety science and also implementation science to really make substantial advances. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we've been really advocating for is that we need to um, ensure that we continue to have funding for research. Unfortunately, in the U.S., the funding for re safety research has actually been going down, and so um, I'm hoping that that trend will change, but it's something that I think is important to mention uh, globally to, you know, to everybody to say there is a need to continue to have um, uh, more research on safety science and implementation. All right, number five, um, addressing safety across the entire care continuum. Uh, as I mentioned, most care is given outside of hospitals um, to air as human, and most of the statistics that we've seen on, on harms have focused on inpatient care. There's also, getting back to research, far less research on uh, ambulatory settings or settings outside of hospitals um, and understanding what the risks are in those settings. Uh, and there's um, a lack of real knowledge around what are the processes and structures that are going to be needed, needed to deliver care safely and evaluate safety of care in these various settings. So, for example, most hospitals have a quality and safety department, but, you know, what is the structure and expertise and capability that's going to be needed in a um, uh, you know, a, a dialysis clinic or in a five-person primary care practice or in a nursing home and really understanding what those structures and, and processes need to be, I think, is, uh, is where we need to go um, in the future. There was, uh, in 2018, a report from OECD that really highlighted how big an issue uh, safety outside of hospitals really is. Um, you see some of the statistics here, safety lapses in primary and ambulatory care are common. Many of them can be avoided. 20 to 25 percent of the general population experience harm in this setting in both developed and developing countries. Up to 80 percent of that harm could be avoided. Um, half of the global disease burden uh, may originate in, uh, from patient harm may originate in primary and ambulatory care. Um, and then certainly there's financial and economic costs as well. So um, this is a, a really useful report, I think, to again just draw our attention to the scope of the problem in, in these settings. 
we had done a survey in the United States of the general public and asked people if they had experienced uh, medical error. And if they did, um, which in the U.S. at least was about 40% of the general public said they or a close friend or family member had experienced a medical error, um, and more than half said it had occurred in an outpatient setting. So again, really thinking about, you know, our, the, our attention has been inpatient and we need to, we need to broaden that out. Um, so in terms of what we know about ambulatory safety, um, these topics here are really based on primary care. Um, we uh, um, have seen the most research done in the primary care setting. So these are kind of the top three areas that come up in primary care, medication safety and things like um, medication errors, but also um, issues with adherence, with polypharmacy, with medication reconciliation, all those kinds of things. Uh, transitions of care, certainly from hospital out. Uh, and having things fall through the cracks in that transition, but also transitions across the entire care continuum. If you think about a rehabilitation facility to home, or if you think about a nursing home to an emergency department, there's all these transitions and potential risks with them. And then missed and delayed diagnosis has been the hot area in primary care, particularly um, as uh, an area that uh, has been coming up a lot in, in malpractice cases, but also in, um, you know, in other studies showing that there's significant rate of missed and delayed diagnosis. And it's also brought up this very important issue of cognitive error, which I think um, until diagnostic error became prominent in our thinking, that cognitive error had been uh, less of a focus and now it's becoming much more of a focus. So. Um, that's what we know in primary care as the top three, but I say that's just the tip of the iceberg because that list is going to look very different if you're in a cardiology practice or if you are thinking about safety in the home setting. Um, and so uh, we need to delineate these, these top risks for all of these settings and then uh, think about ways that we're going to mitigate them. And then, as I mentioned, infrastructure. Uh, there's lots of things we've learned from the inpatient setting about things that we need to have, such as culture, the systems approach, a way to report events, et cetera, and we need to transfer these kinds of uh, principles to all of these varied outpatient settings and learn how to do that effectively. All right, so number six, support the healthcare workforce. So. Uh, I tend to spend a lot of time on this particular recommendation because, um, generally speaking, it's, it's um, newer for many organizations to really think about um, workforce physical and psychological safety. And tying back to my earlier comments about how we think this is really a precondition to achieving patient safety. And professionals really need support to fulfill their highest potential as healers, and we need to think about their physical and emotional harm, also give them ongoing training and learning opportunities to start to be, uh, have them be more skilled in quality and safety so they can uh, uh, work to improve the system that they're working in, give them agency to do that, which ultimately can also um, uh, provide them with uh, uh, increasing joy in work as well. And this concept of joy in work, I think, has really um, spread over the last five years or so, um, where it's sort of shifted from this very kind of almost feeling like a sentimental notion to be really something that, that organizations are um, really trying to push forward. And I'll show you a framework for that in a moment. Um, so workplace safety is inextricably linked to patient safety, and unless the caregivers are given the support they need, um, they're going to be more likely to make errors, fail to follow safe practices, and not work well in teams. So we cannot ignore this workforce piece. Um, I'll go through these very quickly. These are just some uh, slides with some data around physical harm rates. Again, these are mainly from the U.S., but I would encourage you to find out what the rates are in your context. Um, but in the U.S., healthcare is more dangerous than mining, manufacturing, or construction, and we have also significant rates of workplace violence, as highlighted in the uh, last bullet there, about um, a nurse or physician having a higher chance of being assaulted than a significantly higher chance of being assaulted than a, than a cab driver in an urban setting. And then there's psychological harm lack of respect, lack of support, potential discrimination, um, production pressures, poor work design, scheduling demands, et cetera, that um, 
all can lead to issues related to uh, burnout. And, um, and that has certainly been a huge um, area that we're seeing uh, high burnout rates amongst physicians, nurses, pharmacists, all sorts of healthcare professionals. So um, I'll share some examples of things that are out there to try to um, uh, help address this issue. This is from uh, Kaiser Permanente, a big system in the United States. Um, they, they, um, they, are, they are bigger than many countries out there in the world in terms of the number of patients that they take care of, and they have made workplace safety a, a huge priority for them, and they um, uh, do a survey of their employees, and in the survey there are these four questions that they turn into a kind of aggregate score called their workplace safety index. And so the questions are shown here, um, necessary steps taken in my unit to ensure employee and physician safety, um, uh, my supervisor recognizes me when I do a good job, I have the resources to do my work, and I'm treated with respect. And interestingly, these are generally questions around psychological safety. Yet when Kaiser looks at these questions in comparison to their physical harm rates, if a unit scores well on those questions in the top 20th percentile, their injury rates are 83% lower than units that score very poorly. And so these psychological safety questions are at least correlated with physical harm rates. And so what Kaiser is doing is going to those units that are scoring poorly, the ones in blue there, and um, making interventions because they know that those are the high-risk units for both psychological safety issues as well as, as well as physical safety issues. ISI has been doing quite a bit of work in this area as well and um, has been focusing, as I mentioned, on this concept of joy and work. And this is the joy and work framework that um, was put together at IHI. And you'll see physical and psychological safety is there at the top. Um, because that is a key component. You cannot have joy in work if you're getting physically and psychologically harmed. Um, so that's really a foundational piece. But the goal should not be avoidance of burnout. The goal should be achieving joy, and this framework provides really concrete things around ways to get to that um, uh, component of joy, including recognition and reward, um, participative management, camaraderie and teamwork, daily improvement, as I mentioned, having um, uh, these improvement skills, uh, feeling like you have autonomy, and then wellness and resilience are in there as well. And, you know, I'll note that a lot of organizations have done a lot with resilience training and other things, but I think that alone in a vacuum without a lot of these other types of things is not going to um, get organizations to where they need to be. So I think this framework is really helpful as you think about what you will be um, trying to do for your, um, for your workforce in your organizations. And then um, the last thing I'll share is this uh, diagram from Cincinnati Children's in the U.S., which, which really highlights that um, they're really shifting from talking about patient safety and workforce safety to talking about safety. And any time they share safety uh, measures, they side by side have employee harm measures uh, with patient harm measures. So if they have serious safety events for patients, they have lost time injuries for um, the workforce. If they have a serious harm index for patients, they have OSHA recordable injuries for the workforce, et cetera. And so they are just saying safety now. They've integrated all of the work. They've integrated and broken down, down silos across the work, and they use the same methodologies to analyze events of harm for workforce as they have been doing for patients. And so I think this is where the field is ultimately really going, is this very integrated approach. Okay, number seven, partnering with patients and families for the safe, safest care. And so this is really about engagement with patients and families at all levels of healthcare. And that involvement and engagement needs to be truly authentic. It can't just be, oh, we're going to check off the box that we have a patient on this committee, but the patient um, doesn't feel empowered to speak up and no one really listens, which unfortunately we see. Um, so it really needs to be authentic. and. The reason this is so important, as we all know, is that patient engagement is, is linked with patient satisfaction and experience, but also with safer care and improved work experience for caregivers. This is why caregivers went into care in the first place, was, is to engage with their patients and better health outcomes. So engagement is truly critical. And when we talk about different levels of um, uh, uh, engagement, 
you can see in this um, uh, framework from uh, the WISH uh, uh, Innovation, the, the World Innovation Summit for Health, WISH, um, there's different levels where patients uh, can be engaged. So at the uh, community level, certainly at the direct care level, uh, in terms of things like shared decision making, at the organizational level, uh, in terms of at the unit level or hospital or health system level, at the governance level, and at the public policy level, thinking about patients on national uh, policy committees, et cetera, and then um, certainly along the research continuum as well. And so there's many different ways that we need to be engaging patients in the work that we're doing. Here are examples of ways that organizations are doing this. So again, it can be at the sharp end um, uh, in direct patient care with things like shared decision-making tools or multidisciplinary rounds at the bedside with patients and families. It could be at the organizational level with uh, patient family advisory councils, patient reporting systems, patients on root cause analyses. Um, and so these are all the types of tools that organizations are starting to use to bring engagement into um, into their context, in addition to, as I mentioned, having patients really serving on um, uh, committees at the, at the national uh, level around uh, policy and other things. All right, and uh, number eight, last but certainly not least, is ensure that technology is safe and optimized to improve patient safety. You know, it's interesting because we were talking about foundational things to improve patient safety when we came up with these eight recommendations. And we felt like technology is so foundational now to how care is being given that it really merited having a recommendation uh, related to it. Um, we know technology has proven potential to improve patient safety, um, but now we're really also understanding that it has that potential to improve patient safety, but only if we can also minimize the risks. And so we need to optimize those benefits and minimize the unintended consequences. Um, so here are some of the technologies that we know can reduce errors significantly, and this is just a, a random sampling. There's many other technologies um, that exist, but certainly some of the earliest ones were computerized physician order entry and barcode technology and e-prescribing and those kinds of things in the medication space. Um, and as we've started to implement them, one of the things I say is, you know, we kind of spent the last decade convincing people to implement technology, and now we need to spend the time thinking about how we're going to optimize them. Because as we've implemented, we have noticed that we are seeing unintended consequences, uh, such as over-alerting and people ignoring alerts because there's too many, so we need to optimize how we alert. There's a lot of variability across vendors, and so, you know, uh, one clinic could get uh, an electronic prescribing system uh, from vendor A, and another clinic could get a system from vendor B, and it turns out vendor A and B have, you know, uh, they could be 50% higher rates of, of errors in prescribing with vendor B versus A, yet um, those clinics had no idea that that was the case. So transparency is going to be important, but also some safety standards in these types of tools to make sure that when you're purchasing them, uh, you're getting the same level of safety. Uh, we need improved interoperability. We need to improve implementation, and this ties into the implementation science recommendation that I had mentioned uh, in the research uh, recommendation, which is we need to understand how to best implement. There's data out of the U.S. that 42% uh, of hospitals are, uh, and the nurses in the hospitals are failing to scan both the patient and the medication for at least 95% of administrations. That's a high bar, 95%. Um, but still, if we're not scanning the patient and the medication in a reliable way, that's how errors are going to happen. And the whole point of barcoding is to prevent those errors. And then we know there's other unintended consequences, such as um, uh, the one that I get asked about the most when I give talks on technology and safety is uh, copy and paste or cut and paste and the fact that clinical documentation has really changed significantly um, with the advent of electronic medical records and uh, I would say no one really predicted that this would happen and so now we're really playing catch up trying to figure out how are we going to solve some of these documentation challenges that the electronic um, medical record has created where now we have you know, discharge summaries that went from being five pages long to being 25 pages long and it's very hard to 
actually figure out what happened during that hospitalization. And so we as a field are going to need to think about how do we solve some of these unintended consequences because the answer is not we're going to go back to paper charts. We're going to stick with this technology and we need to figure out how to use it, uh, use it better. The other um, challenge has been that uh, there's lots of studies out there, this is just one, that talk about how EHR is contributing to burnout. Um, and there's been poor usability and really not user-centered design and those sorts of things in the design of these systems. And so this is another unintended consequence that we really need to address with better design systems and better implementation so we can, again, get the value out of these technologies that we think um, uh, we truly can. So that was a whirlwind tour through those eight recommendations that I do think are really critical foundational areas that we need to focus on to accelerate our progress in patient safety. Um, uh, you know, we talk about safety as a top priority or a core value and really about safety as a public health issue given the rates of harm that we're seeing. Um, these eight recommendations outline a framework because we still need to uh, make much more substantial progress in how we um, are improving patient safety. And so hopefully these recommendations will also help you in all of your efforts uh, to create that world where patients and those who care for them are free from harm. And, um, and I thank you all for all your efforts that you're doing around the world. Uh, to really work on this acceleration. So with that, I will uh, wrap up and uh, pass it over to uh, Jonathan for the Q&A. Great. Thank you, T. Jal. That was an amazing and fantastic whirlwind overview. So much <laughs> in there, and the chat box has been alive with comments and questions. So we're going to turn, first of all, to Jonathan as our guest. Uh, questionnaire. Jonathan. Hi, thanks very much, Miss um, TGR. That was fantastic. The biggest compliment I could pay you is that when I got an advanced copy of your slides, I was disappointed I only got to ask one question because there is so much yeah. in there to, to unpick and debate. So, so thanks again. But but here's, here's my question. So uh, resilience engineering and safety to offer an alternative approach to improving safety. And it's suggested can resolve some of the challenges that result from those more traditional approaches to managing safety in a complex system that you've highlighted. Have these approaches featured in your work? And where would you suggest an organization begins when adopting a safety two approach? Yeah, um, so that's a terrific question. And um, you know, the way I have been thinking about safety one and safety two has really been that they are a both and, uh, and we need both approaches. And I think it's really important to, most places have started with the safety one approach, so to bring in that safety two approach I think is really critical. And, um, you know, the ways that I've seen organizations starting to do that are uh, in a couple of ways. And one is really thinking about how do we learn from the positives and from the cases that go really well. And that has multiple benefits, uh, you know, it, Certainly we want to learn from those cases, but also when you think about workforce engagement and burnout and other things, it's a great way to highlight uh, the positives and to give reward and recognition for things when they do go well. So it ties into that joy and work framework, et cetera. So I've seen organizations really starting to think about, for example, root cause analysis and um, if that's a methodology that you're using and picking cases of uh, that went really well and particularly maybe a case that you're kind of surprised went well because it was really complicated or there were a lot of, you know, things that happened and yet it still went really well and doing the root cause analysis to understand why that happened and then how could we spread some of those um, resiliencies that probably um, were required for that um, to other parts of the organization or other scenarios. So that's an example of things I've seen organizations starting to do. Um, the other um, piece, I think, and it ties into the safety measurement piece that I had mentioned, is really starting to think about how you can move upstream and move towards uh, identifying risks and hazards proactively as opposed to waiting for the harm to occur um, and thinking about that with, with um, uh, sort of early warning systems and triggers and all sorts of things and building in efforts to, to try to address those things early. So, so those are a couple of ways that I think I've been seeing organizations trying to move into that safety uh, to realm.
start first of all with one from Joe Matthews, who is our Head of Safety at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and I think you had a, a chat with last week. Um, and Joe has highlighted that your presentation calls out the physical and psychological safety of the workforce is a necessary precondition to ensuring safety. Um, in the UK context, this has been very much reinforced recently by the David Naylor work in the King's Fund, who's been highlighting that a conversational culture is fundamental to keeping people safe. Civility saves lives. What advice would you have for us in Scotland around building a positive, psychologically safe conversational culture? So can I ask a clarify? I, I want to make sure I understand what is meant by that term, conversational culture. I think I know, but I want to make sure I have the full sense of what that term means. So it, it's very much about this concept of um, civility. It's that respect to each other. Mm. It, yeah, it's the, the, and the, the data, I think, that's increasingly coming through that being disrespectful to individuals actually has a really big consequence on safety and team cultures. Yeah, and, you know, I think that, um, so I think there's lots of strategies and tactics out there to try to um, address this. And, and uh, you know, Lucian Leap, uh, who's often the, considered the founder of the safety movement, uh, says he thinks disrespect is actually the core issue that we need to be addressing. And, and you know, but I think we can turn that into things that are much more um, uh, tangible in terms of, trying to break down the hierarchies, et cetera, and building that psychological safety. So I've seen organizations, for example, first of all, they, I've seen organizations who've done uh, respect training uh, for their clinicians, and there's lots of depth in how they, how they go about doing that, but, but formally investing in respect training. Um, and so Virginia Mason, one of the organizations in the U.S. that's kind of prominent in safety had mandatory respect training and the CEO talked about how he got lots of hate mail initially like I can't believe you're making us do this kind of thing and at the end he got lots of feedback about how it totally changed how people perceived the way that they interacted with their colleagues because they didn't realize the, dis the disrespect that they were um, uh, kind of emitting uh, and, and the training really increased their awareness about it and then I've seen organizations who've had some very um, clear behavioral types of things like look people in the eye, um, make sure you know people's names, um, uh, uh, even things like um, I saw what this was just the other day, I saw, um, you know, uh, uh, asking, uh, asking uh, if you can help, uh, if you see someone in the hall who looks lost, and this is more for respect for patients, like actually taking them where they need to go as opposed to pointing and giving them directions, you know, like just very concrete things to sort of build that culture of respect within the organization. So I think there's a lot of um, pieces to how you can, you can start to build that. Plus, you know, as we talk about uh, uh, behavioral expectations around, for example, disruptive and disrespectful behavior, which I think is one of the most critical things. So if someone is being disrespectful, that there's ways to identify that, that people have the psychological safety to feel like they can report that somewhere, but also that there's actually action that's going to be taken. Because far too long we've seen those behaviors tolerated, especially when there's hierarchy and the person being disrespectful may be, you know, the head of a department or whatever it might be. And so the leadership of an organization really has to have a commitment around uh, the same rules and the same behavioral expectations for everybody. Great advice. Thank you. I'm going to move on to a question by Cecily Cunningham, who's a Scottish Clinical Leadership Fellow from Glasgow. Um, and she says, zero harm is a term that provokes strong reactions, as it can seem unattainable, unrealistic. Much of the safety conversation in the UK is now as much as possible goes right. Have you had discussions about reassessing the use of the term zero harm? Uh, many. <laughs> This has come up a lot, um, and there's been a lot of debate about it. I know there's been recent articles written about it, and um, so, you know, I'll, I know that there are many opinions on it. Um, my uh, take on it, so this is me personally, is I think it is important to have an aspirational goal. Now, that doesn't mean that 
you know, we don't have, okay, we're going to reduce X by 20% this year and so forth. But I think it's important as an organization to set that vision and aspiration that this is where we're trying to get to. And I think it makes us think differently about how we might get there as opposed to being incremental. It helps us to think, um, you know, much more broadly. And I think, you know, um, our patients would be disappointed with anything less. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that that's necessarily what you're, you know, by January 2021, we're going to reduce our diagnostic errors by, you know, X isn't appropriate. But I think that's all in service of this broader aspirational vision. And, you know, I've seen organizations that have really made progress on safety um, through, you know, uh, measures of, of their harm rates, et cetera. And, um, Pretty universally, they've had their leadership, CEO, et cetera, um, talking about zero harm, but then again, having the more concrete things underneath, but sort of setting that aspirational expectation and vision for the organization has been really key. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the blueprint that we created around creating a culture of safety, and vision is one of the domains in that. Uh, we had CEOs at the table who've done really amazing work in patient safety, and, and the vision of zero harm was actually something that they all really uh, were proponents of. So, uh, you know, and trust me, I'm a researcher. I totally get it in terms of, you know, the rigor of how would we actually uh, measure or accomplish that. But I think it's really meant for that aspiration um, more than anything else, and I think that's important. Great. Thank you. Uh, Maria Arthur, who's the Head of Governance at the Royal Wolverhampton NHS Trust, is asking whether or not there are any methods being considered to address cognitive bias errors or de-biasing. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, I mean, I think we're still pretty early on the cognitive um, bias front. There's certainly been efforts to um, think about um, uh, unconscious bias, and, uh, and even uh, training around uh, uh, racism and other things that many organizations have been trying to do around biases related to that. There's also, just if you think about the cognitive biases of, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of early closure or um, uh, the bias where you kind of remember things at the beginning at the end but not things in the middle, um, uh, et cetera, there's a lot of different types of biases that clinicians have when they're thinking about um, making a diagnosis. There's a bias towards believing things that support your hypothesis and then not really believing things that don't support your hypothesis and so on. And many times these biases actually help us make quicker diagnoses that are accurate. So that's also the problem. It's not like they're 100% wrong. They're actually often um, helping us get to a good diagnosis a lot of the time. So all that being said, there's a lot of cognitive biases. And, you know, I think the things that are um, – a few, so a few things that I've seen that people are trying to look at. One is, uh, of course, simulation uh, training and really putting uh, students and residents and, you know, I'd love to see this for, for um, faculty, et cetera, but, you know, through case studies and sort of helping people understand their biases, see how their biases may be causing them to jump to premature conclusions, et cetera. And so I think simulation has real promise for some of this. Um, and then the other thing I think is, um, we've seen, uh, you know, the use of technology and decision support and other things so that, you know, we can ensure that a differential diagnosis is, you know, displayed to a clinician or we can um, ensure that, you know, even though the patient's young and, uh, you know, 30 years old, but, oh, they have a family history of breast cancer, we make sure the clinician realizes they should be doing their, um, you know, working up that breast lump and not, and not uh, uh, you know, ignoring it or whatever it might be. So I think there's ways technology is going to help. I think simulation is definitely an option as well, and I think it's a whole field that needs much more exploration beyond that. One thing I will say, I'll just add, you know, I think um, education and training will get us to a point, but if we think about high reliability, it will never get us to that full state of high reliability. So we're going to need to think about how we design systems to uh, capture these uh, biases, these cognitive errors, et cetera, and capture them early rather than late so that we can intervene because we'll never get rid of cognitive error to err as human. Um, and so I, I do think there's value to the education training simulation piece, but then we're going to have to really think about a more systematic design as well so that we can catch these. And that's where, 
uh, you know, the promise of uh, AI and, and natural language processing and other things like that may also uh, bear fruit in the long term. Thank you. A really interesting area of development. Um, moving on to a question from Arvind uh, Verrera, who is from NHS Lothian, and he's also our his clinical lead for SPSP Medicines. And he calls out this issue around leadership and how has improvement science engaged the heads of professional organizations. And he's commenting that professional groups are often punitive uh, for fear of the regulators and professional bodies rather than because the healthcare organization itself is telling them to be punitive. So what can we do and any advice you would give us about really engaging with professional organizations to address some of these cultural issues? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's really an important one because, um, you know, at least in the U.S., I know, like, I mean, if we, if we look at um, who attends quality and safety meetings, it tends to be the people working in quality and safety, but not necessarily your frontline uh, nursing or clinician group. So, you know, um, we've tried to really engage with a group like the American Nurses Association, for example, that really has the, the ear of nurses. And, and again, in the U.S., I think with physicians, it's much harder. There's so many different professional groups. There's the cardiologist group and the OBGYN group and the primary care group, et cetera. So it has been challenging, um, but I think it's really critical. And so we have seen some progress on this front. I mean, there's been some uh, uh, organizations such as uh, um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology or the American College of Surgeons that have really led efforts around patient safety and, and, and importantly around um, creating some uh, surgical collaboratives so that there can be more learning and sharing across all of the um, uh, people in those specialties. So. So to your question, though, that means it's critical to get the leaders of these organizations to really understand the value of this, to really understand that, you know, punishment and blame is not going to be the answer and that it's got to be about learning and improvement and building for them to build uh, uh, trust with their constituencies about some of these learning and sharing opportunities. Um, and so I think the, the only advice I can say is, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort and meetings and just, you know, constant trying to, um, make sure you've got the, the time and visibility with the leaders of those organizations to get them to understand um, the importance, and then maybe finding some of those shining lights of organizations that have that have made progress on this front and really and really um, found value with it um, to use as uh, again learning from the positive deviance as examples to say, hey, if the American College of Surgeons can do it, or if the you know um, uh, pediatricians can do it, you know. Let's see how you could do it in your context. So, so it's a great point, though. I think those are those associations have a lot of power. Um, they have a lot of reach, and so they need to be part of part of uh, uh, you know what we're trying to work on. Thank you. So we've got time for one final uh, quick question. This one is from David Grayson, who's the clinical director at Watimata, I think, District Health Board. I'm not sure if I've said that right. I'm sure I'll find out if I haven't. <laughs> Uh, his question is, with the rapid adoption of technology in healthcare, is it likely that we will soon suffer a Boeing moment? Um, I think we're seeing the Boeing moments already. I mean, honestly, like there's so many, um, you know, so much data out there about the new harms that technology is introducing. Um, and. Uh, and sometimes it can be over-reliance on technology. It can be, um, uh, you know, I mean, Boeing, obviously, the pilot couldn't overcompensate for what the technology was doing. So, you know, I just think that we're there. I mean, I think, and, and full disclosure, like, I'm somebody who studied technology, you know, 15 years ago and said we need to implement these technologies. But, um, but we haven't designed and implemented them well, and we're seeing, you know, we are seeing harm from these technologies and, um uh, you know, we've, we've got to do something about it. So I guess we haven't had the one that's, you know, that's made the front page of the New York Times yet, but, um, you know, the, the, we've seen some that have been pretty high profile. You know, Bob Wachter wrote a book about um, 
oh, I'm forgetting the name of his book, but anyway, he wrote a book and he talked about a huge error at UCSF with, you know, the, uh, you know, somebody given, instead of one pill of Bactrim, they were given 27 pills of Bactrim or something like that, and it was all based on technology and so forth. So there's been some pretty visible um, examples of technology uh, really leading to harm, and so I think we have to, we just have to now figure out how we're going to optimize as we go forward, and part of that is going to be partnership with vendors, and part of that is, um, again, the implementation piece, because much of this is not necessarily even around the design of the technology, but around how we are implementing it, and often implementing really poorly and around allowing, you know, 10 different docs to use it 10 different ways and that sort of stuff. So, so there are multiple components to, to trying to turn the tide on some of those unintended consequences. That's great. Thank you so much. We haven't had time to pick up all of the questions. Um, I think the quality of the presentation has generated a lot of discussion on the chat box um, and really appreciate you sharing your thoughts there, Tijal, with us. Thank you so much. Um, our time is up, sadly, just before we close, just to highlight who we have coming up in 2020. So we've had these speakers all confirmed. We have two more to follow. The full lineup will be announced very soon, together with the dates and the times. So if you keep an eye on Twitter, uh, we'll be announcing on Twitter dates and times, and you can also join our mailing list if you haven't done so uh, so far. So here's to wish you all a fantastic Christmas, as this is the last time we'll speak before then, and we look forward to joining up with you again in 2020, our new decade. Thank you, everyone. Jennifer, back in the speaker's private conference. Everything okay for you? Yeah, it was Thank you. How's the speaker still on the line? You have Jonathan with you and yeah, Tijel disconnected. Yeah. I forget every single <laughs> thing to say to the speaker still. Jonathan, thank you so much. That was such a good question. And thank you. Your, your contributions to the chat box is absolutely brilliant. Um, there's so many